there are four very large uh, posters of JWST images from recent uh, releases. So go in and ogle those during the breaks. Those are, are pretty amazing. A lot of structure in there to look at. Um, our speaker is from Arizona State University. His name is Roger Windhorst. He is a JWST interdisciplinary scientist. Um, he's um, been working with JS JWST for decades as it, it went through the process of um, getting developed and launched and now doing the science. He's uh, before that he um, got his degrees in Leiden um, studying radio galaxies. Then he came to um, Caltech or Pasadena for a postdoctoral at uh, Carnegie Observatories and Caltech and um, became involved with the Wide Field Planetary One camera for Hubble and then uh, sort of graduated into more and more Hubble work. He's used all of Hubble's instruments. He's, he's had um, 80 or so funded projects with Hubble. He's uh, and then came naturally over into JWST and uh, his his primary um, area of research is is early galaxies and galaxy evolution and what's happening in the very first um, uh, era of the universe, the epoch of first light and of reionization. And he's going to tell us about some of that today with a reionization talk. So let me turn things over to Roger. Thank you, Tom. Make sure that uh, I can be heard back. Yeah, I got water. Thanks. Um, it's great to be here in this weather, which reminds me of the Netherlands. Um, we had a word for this kind of uh, sky. We called it Dutch photometric, a uniform extinction at all air masses. <laughs> it's that's why the Dutch were so good at radio astronomy, because we were never really doing much optical. But um, you folks at both here, you got a great optical observatory and uh, radio telescopes that uh, Don Klein has on his uh, um, property. So let's see if this comes back up. We had to. Yeah, here we go. Uh, better than last night. So. Um, I know a number of you folks were here last night, but most of you were not. So I will say a few things about JWST, but not about the project. I will primarily talk about one of the big mysteries in the universe. The universe is reionized, meaning that, you know, the back after the Big Bang, it was 75, 76% hydrogen and 24% helium and nothing else. And then when the first star started forming, it became, um, you know, 75% hydrogen. Some of it went into stars and planets after heavier elements were produced that produced, uh, um, you know, silicon and iron, magnesium and everything that you find under your feet in the ground um, and 24% helium. And those two elements together drove stellar evolution um, with these gases around in the universe. You're not supposed to really see much through the universe in the ultraviolet because both hydrogen and helium as atoms are very good in taking um, that light away. And we also know that since redshift six anyway, probably starting redshift eight, when the universe was between a billion and uh, 700 million years after the Big Bang, um, the gas between the galaxies became ionized. So you could start looking through it. That didn't used to be the case earlier on, which we call the dark ages. So I have some charts on that. So we're going to look at how galaxies and quasars produce their um, ultraviolet light that kept the universe ionized and transparent uh, since redshift six, since the first billion years. So we can actually look through it, which is very useful in the ultraviolet. So we're going to talk about galaxies and quasars. So I was looking for a good quasar here. It's off the chart, uh, but many of the galaxies, as you will see, have a active nucleus in the center. I'll use my cursor here. Um, this one is an elliptical, for instance, but it got a fairly bright core and you can see the signature of a, a point source a star. We call the point spread function is also visible here. That's because there's an accretion disk 
around a supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy as there is in many other galaxies. And the question is whether it's these black hole accretion disks or the star forming galaxies like this one or that one that are kind of bluish that produce all that ultraviolet light. It has to be there because we can look through the universe. Let's see. Yesterday we did something with the remote. I think we had an extra um, thing um, in here. Well, I'll use the cursors to advance the charge, but I could use the clicker last time. Oh, here it is. That's probably, sorry, give me a minute. To put that clicker in, and now I should be able to advance. Yeah, with the, good. Okay then, so the outline for today is the power of space and ground-based spectroscopy in the context of chasing that Lyman continuum. I'll talk about the Lyman continuum, which is the radiation that comes out uh, in principle below 912 angstrom. That is the photon that ionizes the hydrogen at the higher redshifts. As you will see, it's actually good enough to uh, um, look below 1216 angstroms, which corresponds to the first um, um, step of the electron in the Bohr model. And we use for that the uh, Hubble White Field Camera 3 UVIS detector, that the one that I was involved in since 1998. It was launched in 2009 during the last uh, shuttle mission to um, Hubble. Uh, and then um, third, we'll talk about the promise and power of Webb to uh, make Lyman continuum constraints at high redshifts. These are indirect constraints, not because Webb is not good enough, but because you know, in order to look through the universe, the hydrogen needs to be more or less completely ionized because neutral hydrogen is opaque. It's a gas that absorbs the UV light. This ionization was in principle complete after the first billion years by redshift six, but sort of it, some of it lingered around and it's not until redshifts four, the first two billion years or so, that you can really look through it. So the era that JWST is good at the highest redshifts, the hydrogen is already a big blocker of the UV light. So you have to use indirect constraints, but I'll show you how we'll do that. And then we'll give you summary and conclusions. I'll give you the conclusions here for the sake of time. Um, so I'm going to argue that both small galaxies, I'll call them the dwarfs, have small holes in their interstellar medium. And those are um, good enough to let some of this Lyman continuum radiation escape. We catch this in the single parameter that we call the escape fraction. And then we have uh, active galactic nuclei, uh, nuclei uh, that make bigger holes in the interstellar medium, and they produce generally uh, higher escape fractions, and they dominate at least at the higher redshifts. And the debate that's now going on with JWST, you may have heard of all these very high redshift galaxies they found, you know, the highest redshift confirmed spectroscopically is 13. That's like the first 300 million years. Um, but there are candidates out there, redshift 17 and 20. They haven't been confirmed yet. And some people say, well, they're not real. They're foreground interlopers. Other people say, well, they may be real, but they may not be galaxies. And as of last week, the conference in Baltimore, I now have a hunch that anything at very high redshift first 300 million years may not actually be a galaxy. It could well be real, but it could just be an active galactic nucleus that's you know, quickly forming a black hole before the galaxy forms. And um, the black hole quickly triggers formation of stars surrounding it, as we will see, and that creates an enormous amount of dust. So in most cases, these black holes with their accretion disk and the forming galaxy, um, they, um, <coughs> They are shrouded by dust. And so then the question is, how can even this uh, hard UV radiation escape through the dust and the gas? And we'll talk about that today. So either the dwarfs or the giants that caused it. So after the Big Bang, as you know, this is the axis of time. Uh, redshift goes backwards in time, redshift 10, redshift 50, redshift 1000. So after the first, you know, 10 to the minus 33 seconds or less, you had the exponential expansion that drove the inflation where the first particles were formed and quantum fluctuations seeded the structure 
that became more transparent after redshifts 1000, 1089 to be precise, where we observed the microwave background. You had John Mather here talk seven years ago about that, that got him the Nobel Prize after measuring that precisely. And that's where hydrogen first became neutral. So this, this part of the universe is totally invisible. Never see it except maybe with neutrinos or other things that penetrate this barrier. So it's ionized here and fully neutral here. Then there was, in terms of cosmic time, you can roughly think of how long ago this was. It's almost 14 billion years, right? 13.8 billion years in the past. If you want to use this redshift scale and the Z scale and divide by one over one plus Z, you get uh, the fraction of the age of the universe. So it was, it's not exactly true, but close enough. 378,000 years where this event happened, all the protons and electrons became hydrogen and also for helium. That's really all the universe had for a long time, for the first 100, 200, 300 million years. It was just neutral gas until these quantum fluctuations from the Big Bang started forming the first, well, I won't say galaxies anymore, the first entities, maybe black holes, that seeded the formation of stars surrounding them. And then by redshift 10 and finishing a redshift 7 and 8, so after the first four, 500 million years, there was enough light produced by these active nuclei in dwarf galaxies to ionize the universe. So it was about here that the universe became transparent. And that's the time back in the past, the first 400 million years, how far Hubble can look back. Past that, Hubble just runs out of steam. It doesn't have the infrared coverage. Webb can look further back into the infrared, which you know, the higher redshift causes the light to move further into the infrared. Redshift 50 is optimistic. I think this um, this chart was not made by somebody who actually designed the telescope. But redshift 20 over here, I think, is feasible. We see him out of redshift 13 for certain, and redshift you know 17 to 20. We have candidates. We just don't quite know what they are. So the big question is, the UV light, does it come from the active galactic nuclei or the dwarf galaxies to make this universe over here transparent? So it, I'll cast it in this form. Um, you know, for the last 30 years, well, Gunn and Peterson discovered this reionized universe from the spectra of quasars in the early 70s. So we've known it for more than 40 years. But in the last decade or two from Hubble, we have come to believe that the dwarfs, the dwarf galaxies, are actually outshining um, the, the quasars, the, the giants. But at the moment, I don't think that's true anymore. I think the giants actually won the match, um, but the galaxies thought they might have won the right match for a while. And so we're going to talk about this, that the, the giant was not slain, but in fact won the match. And um, Hubble and I think also Webb are telling us that the uh, AGN, the active nuclei, outdid the dwarf galaxies. Uh, uh, that's David slaying the giant, but his mother didn't like that. So pictorially, I'm going to cast it in two um, pictures here. Uh, I gave this talk in Crete uh, in, in March for the first time, and I thought this, this was from the uh, um, Historical Museum in Heraklion, an old um, Hellenistic uh, gun is a good um, um, pictorial um, image to have in mind for how quasars, um, you know, affect their neighborhood. Um, an active galactic nucleus will produce a lot of uh, outflow in a fairly narrow cone that will ionize, while galaxies are, you know, mostly opaque with gas and dust. Here it's rocks, but there is some holes in the gas and the dust created by supernova explosions through which the hot starlight can escape. So the Lyman continuum is very hard to uh, observe directly. I will make some speculations, but you know, if you want to, the simple takeaway is we have big galactic fortresses with small holes, and then we have these active galactic nuclei. So that's a good uh, way of thinking about the uh, giants that contributed to reionization. And this is a good way to think about the dwarfs that have holes in them and contribute to reionization. So let's get a little more technical. Um, using ground-based spectra um, as a start, because this can be in part done from the ground at a lower redshift, and also FUSE, which is a far ultraviolet space telescope, a small one that was launched many decades ago. And typically I'll start with this one, what you see in the ultraviolet, the spectrum 
I hope this is sharp enough. Uh, the spectrum of a, um, a galaxy here in black um, always shows this dramatic drop here at 912 angstroms. That's simply because the foreground hydrogen, which is in still part neutral, will eat uh, any of the light away. So in, in theory, in red, the, the spectrum looks like this, and it's dominated by hot stars. So you plot the flux density in these units versus wavelength. The spectrum would just continue if there were no hydrogen in the foreground. But if you put a little hydrogen in the foreground, then it will drop to this. Uh, what you actually observe is this. So there is a, you know, a, a factor of five step, and that then leads to um, the conclusion that the escape fraction of this object is 21%. So all of the light that it produced below this alignment limit, as we call it, below 912 angstroms, only 20, 21% escapes. Uh, so it has, if you wish, if you look at the thing as a, conceive it as a sphere, 21% of this sphere's area will have holes in it through which the light escapes. So that would be a contributor to reionization. So it's this fellow over here, but it's at lower redshift and its escape fraction below the Lyman limit is um, very small. It's, um, um, it, it's, it's of the order of um, one to two percent. Um, so not an easy measurement. Um, this can also be done from the ground with large telescopes in a limited redshift range around redshift three. You need to now be looking beyond the atmospheric cutoff at 3300 angstroms. So you have to do it at a larger redshift. These are spectra by Chuck Steidel, really beautiful, you know, hot uh, stellar spectra in young star forming galaxies with all the usual absorption lines and Balmer lines. And then um, below 912 angstroms, there is um, a, a drop, maybe not entirely to zero. They make always a significant effort to put the zero level at exactly the right level. And that then leads to escape fractions of the order of uh, two to six percent observed and you make a correction for the model it's, it's about six to nine percent so overall these escape fractions are small no more than a few to twenty percent of these galaxies uh, let their alignment continuum escape or no more than you know twenty percent of the area of these galaxies let the uh, ionizing radiation escape we go to the higher redshifts where we can do it with Hubble um, even below the atmospheric cutoff, we make these kinds of filters. These were designed, I was involved in this in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s. It takes typically 15 years to build a camera for Hubble before you can launch it. Um, these are the good old uh, visual blue and UV filters. The eye can really not see much below 3600 angstrom. So this is sort of the last filter you could do from the ground. These two filters, the 275 and the 225, you multiply that by 10, you get a central wavelength in angstrom, were made especially for the wide field camera three. And they were very hard to make because these are UV uh, pieces of glass that need to transmit the UV radiation but they are not allowed to transmit any of the long wavelength radiation because you don't want the spectrum of the galaxy or quasar at the longer wavelengths to look, leak in. So you need to make what we call the red leak wings of these filters really far down. The top here is a unit of 10. The bottom is at you know 10 to the minus four. So it's, it is about a factor of 100,000 down. And you need that. So when you look in the rest frame, of the spectra of these galaxies here in red for a dustier older one or in green for a somewhat younger galaxy or in blue for a quasar with the usual quasar emission lines, Lyman alpha, carbon four, uh, and some other lines here. And you can see that in principle at the lower redshift, these quasars do transmit some Lyman continuum radiation. The dotted line is usually the 912 angstrom limit. Uh, and galaxies like the green one does also transmit some, but less than the quasar. And so when you have these filters, the 336 and the 275 to 25 here, at these redshifts between, you know, 3, 2.5 and 2.3, you can actually measure for each of these objects how much Lyman continuum is escaping uh, that galaxy for these various uh, spectral energy distributions. So we do this for a limited redshift range typically between two and three and a half, because at redshift four, the universe becomes partially opaque already, and redshift past six, it's fully opaque due to the hydrogen. And so it depends a little bit on whether you're looking in certain directions 
in a lucky sightline or not, um, whether you can observe this. Um, so we, we designed the camera so that it could do this. And then we had a sample. This was one of my students, now postdoc, Brand Smith, and it's been done by many other people. Basically what you do in terms of absolute and apparent magnitude, you're all familiar with the astronom astronomical magnitude system, I, I assume, um, for this sample at redshift two and a half to three, where this is the observed magnitude and this is at the given redshift, the um, uh, corresponding absolute magnitude. This is all at 1500 angstroms in the rest frame. So it would be at, at this location here where you're looking beyond the Lyman alpha line and the spectrum is well behaved. And, and that amount of light tells you how many blue stars there are. And um, you can see that the sample is actually not complete past 24 and a half, 25 or so, as this blue line indicates. We do detect some objects, but we don't get them all. We should have seen many more past this, uh, fainter than this absolute magnitude, but the completeness is not perfect. But I'll argue later, this is also true for the galaxies with the AGN and all galaxies together. But um, between 20, <coughs> A third and 24 and a half magnitude or so. The sample is at least um, representative and they have similar um, magnitude distribution. So we're going to assume that we may use this sample because this is the only sample we can do it with to uh, study the uh, Lyman continuum escaping from the galaxies. So normally what I'll try to do is um, always indicate the Lyman continuum image in purple, purple label, and the UV continuum, the 1500 angstroms in red. So this is what we observed for the AGN, almost nothing. It's a noisy field with some flux here. And uh, so this is for all the objects. I read that wrong, all the, the galaxies. And this is for the AGN, 16 of them. And this is for 17 AGN, one brighter one that luckily shown in our direction. So it was actually dominated by one out of the 16 giants that produced all this Lyman continuum flux. And um, that's for the galaxy. So there is not a whole lot of flux there. And if you add all 110 objects or 111 objects up, you get a little bit of flux here, but it's really only dominated by this one object, this one lucky AGN that will study a little more detail. Um, Here's the same uh, row of data, but smooth. So you can see there's really flux here. There's some flux there that's rather irregular. We'll come to that, what that means. While the total summed flux, so we basically stack up all the images after we bring them all to the same spatial scales. The, uh, the longer wavelength continuum at 1500 angstroms is all very irregular, both for the AGN and for the galaxies. And so we're gonna study the difference between the Lyman continuum and the UV continuum to make um, statements about the escape fraction. Here's how we do that. Here's that one bright uh, AGN redshift 2.6. Um, there is a Sloan spectrum of it here. There's an X-ray spectrum of it even. And here's our Hubble detection in the 275 filter. There was even a galaxy, a small UV satellite launched from the wings of a B-52 a number of years ago by Caltech that observed it at a slightly shorter wavelength because it was so bright. And you can see that the prediction from a reasonably good model that goes all the way from the um, accretion disk into the X-rays because the AGN accretion disks get hot enough that they shine in the X-rays. You can see that we're almost um, a factor of three down in flux. And so we deduce from this, from the two independent measurements, that the escape fraction is 28 to 30 percent. So actually quite well determined around 30 percent with a small error. You do have to do Monte Carlo simulations for each of these measurements because you don't know when you're looking there or there, you know, two of the same quasars. One, you get this lucky detection, the other one you don't, and that's because there could be still some foreground hydrogen clouds in the way in one direction that you don't have in the other direction. So for this lucky sightline, um, we did that simulation. We say, uh, you know, the escape fraction is most likely this value, but it has some spread to it. The spread is not because of the observational error but it's because of guesstimating from, uh, you know, the known density of hydrogen clouds, how much hydrogen have could, could have gotten in, in your way between us and that quasar. That's tricky business. Now let's um, 
go to a more modern sample. This is a paper by Smith et al. almost to be submitted. This is companion paper for the galaxies uh, from a survey called UV candles. It's in the candles field. If you know where that is, it's uh, some of the goods and cosmos fields where we have a total of 58 AGN. Again, they're all indicated here in the red columns. Uh, you say, well, that looks like a faint quasars that, yeah, it looks like a galaxy with a core. Uh, that's a bit of a train wreck, yet it had an AGN spectrum, which probably comes from this region here. Same true for this fellow over here. And this one, which had a, you know, a quasar-like spectrum, but it was not in the center of the galaxy. At the higher redshift, that's actually more common. The AGN are there, but they're not always sitting in the galaxy center yet. That comes later when the galaxy becomes totally relaxed. In all cases, you can see in the Lyman continuum column, there's clearly light that shines through. In this case, it's not so clear, but in the other cases, there is clearly some Lyman continuum light after you lay down the proper aperture to measure that here. And so we, we conclude here that there's, a, again, about 20% of the AGN have a detectable Lyman continuum, and that will lead to a similar escape fraction as we saw before of the order of 30% with a large error bar. Again, the error bar is not due to the error in the measurements. Most of the time, that's, you know, way more than five sigma. It's due to the uncertainty of the Monte Carlo modeling of how much hydrogen there could be in the various random foregrounds. Um, now we do the same for the galaxies. This is a paper by Wang et al. Uh, resubmitted also from the UV candle sample where we have many more, 96 of them, and we stack them all up. And it doesn't look very impressive. There's the Lyman continuum. Well, a few dots, if you convolve it, you know, maybe some flux, but it doesn't look really like a single galaxy. It looks like a few hotspots. That's my whole point, right? Think of that image of the castle I showed in the beginning. The galaxy may be spherical, but the holes where that light, the light comes out may be at random locations. Well, the average stellar light of these galaxies, all 96 of them, looks like this, you know, fairly round blob. And so um, we're trying to make sense of this. We're now looking at extremely faint magnitudes, even with Hubble, the total flux here is, is no brighter than 29th magnitude, while in the long wavelengths past uh, the Lyman Alpha line, 1500 angstroms, they're quite bright, they're 24 or 25. Um, so that's how we um, you know, estimate the escape fraction for these galaxies. And it's small in this case, five out of 96 or 5%. That means the opening angles for the holes in that castle is no more than 20% of the total area, which I argued before. So that's probably the picture we have to keep in mind. I'm gonna make that a little more clear from the following chart. We first start with a cartoon here. So that's the, uh, the cartoon you need to have in mind. There could be an active nucleus in the galaxy center. There's certainly a, a, a galaxy disk. And then there is, um, you know, supernovae going off in the disk that could, cause some of these flare-ups. There's also outflows um, from um, a central engine if there's a quasar there. And that UV light either uh, made um, by a quasar or in this case a star forming region comes out and it in principle comes out in any direction perpendicular to the disk because the disk contains so much hydrogen, it has no chance to come out in this direction. But on the way out, it could still hit gas clouds that surround the galaxies, like you know, gas clouds we have between us and the large Magellanic clouds. There's quite a bit of hydrogen, but in some lucky directions that radiation comes out. And that's exactly what we think is going on here. This was one of our first papers, but still the best data with the Hubble Whitefield Camera 3. Uh, that's the original stack of 34 galaxies, uh, 12 AGN and the total. Here it is slightly smoothed. You can see most of the flux still comes from the AGN but there is some flux here. And if you add that all up together, uh, typically what you see for the galaxy stellar population, the brightness is the highest in the center, of course, galaxies always look brighter in the center. And then towards larger radii, the brightness declines. We've known this for a long time. This is not true for the escaping Lyman continuum, the Lyman continuum that escapes, as far as we can measure it, all the way to surface brightness of about 30th magnitudes per square arc second. By the way, this is the HST point spread function, so the stellar image size. There is quite extended light that extends quite far out, almost as far as this, but it's very flat. This is what we call a surzic or the vocular profile. This doesn't look like anything. So in other words, it's more like a pepper and salt distribution of little pockets 
that produce that um, Lyman continuum light. And so there's a whole number of papers on that, but I think that the opening angle of the holes that produce this visible light is no bigger than 20 or 40 degrees. And again, here we see that the weak AGN, the giants, produce uh, bigger holes than the uh, galaxies. Um, okay, now let's see how to do it time-wise. Um, I won't get in this too much detail, but just to let you know how we estimate the escape fractions, I showed that on an earlier chart like this. You know, we have a good set of data, a good model, and you determine the ratio, you say, well, it's 30%. We do this for all the objects where we can. Roughly the way it works is to say, well, um, here's a, a, a blue galaxy, you know, the 1,000 to 5,000 angstroms in the rest frame, redshift 2.8, here's the measurements, here's our best fit stellar energy distribution, which of course cuts off right at 912. Uh, but the galaxy also has its own embedded dust. In this case, it's about one magnitude of extinction. We call that the A sub V. So the true spectrum would have been this observed one uh, divided by that extinction, which in this case, a factor of two and a half. So you bring all this flux up by a factor of two and a half. And then you know, if there had been no hydrogen in the foreground, this is really what the spectrum of that object should have looked like, given the observations we have. There's also a weak AGN component in green here, subdominant in this case. In some cases, these AGN components are uh, quite dominant. We'll show you some other examples. And then if you make the observations and you observe that the Lyman continuum is, you know, 20% down from what you predict, then you have an estimate of the escape fraction. We do this for all of them. Sometimes the models aren't perfect. Sometimes the AGN component in green is, is subdominant, uh, but this is what we get. They're still galaxies, but they have an active nucleus, and the active nucleus does produce um, you know, also UV light, and it's just a, measure, a matter of measuring it right, and then make the measurement, and then see how compared to the blue model, the measurement um, um, compares. Here's the, the same thing done for the galaxies, uh, kind of the same story. This is a good example. Um, here's the observations in red. Uh, again, the extinction in this case is mild. It's a tenth of a magnitude, so the true spectrum should have liked like this. And then you observe your alignment continuum here if you can, and that will give you an estimate of the escape fraction. Um, so we did this for all uh, 100 some objects, 150 objects in total. And this is the outcome. Statistically, you need to ask the question, is this sample representative? We saw earlier in the first chart that it's not quite complete. And so you ask the question in the right panel, what does the overall distribution look like? We refer to the 3D HSD sample, that's the total candle sample, I mean, about tenth of a square degree spread over five fields in the sky. They got like 10 filters with Hubble, and so they have accurate measurements of the photometric redshifts in the total mass, and, and involved in each galaxy and the typical galaxies you see in the images outside in the hallway have this kind of mass distribution hope you can read this from the back uh, log mass from you know 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 12 the typical mass is 10 to the 8 10 to the 9 solar mass so they're you know not giant galaxies our galaxy is 10 to the 11 so it would be often this side of scale but it's at redshift zero these folks on average are redshift two or three and so they're typically smaller in their mass um, similarly, and, and then the objects for which we observe the Lyman continuum have a similar distribution, but instead of tens of thousands of galaxies, we only have 150. But to first order, you know, it peaks around 10 to the 9 solar masses, which we see here for the total galaxy population as well. The same is true for the dust distribution. The dust distribution typically is, you know, a 1 over E function, typical value of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which is also what we observe for the Lyman continuum sample. So, in other words, we are sampling more or less ordinary galaxies, where we're just lucky enough to see the Lyman continuum escape from these holes. The same is true for the age distribution. When we observe these galaxies at their redshift, they're typically between a hundred, a few hundred million years and a billion years old. And with a few younger ex ex exceptions, that is also true for most of the galaxies for which we have the Lyman continuum. And then if you ask yourself, how did these galaxies make their stars? while well, they form a number of stars per year, Typically, solar masses per year is the unit used. That's anywhere between very low, 
um, almost no star formation to very high. We'll see some extreme examples, a couple of hundred later on. But the typical star formation rate is of the order of a solar mass a year. And that's also what we observe for our Lyman continuum sample. So in other words, the dust distribution, the mass distribution of our colored Lyman continuum sample and the background galaxies here in black, they're all more or less the same distributions. And that allows us then to estimate the dust extinction well, because you need to know that uh, when you make your estimate um, of um, the escape fraction. I won't talk about this, I already talked about that. In the end, what we find for the AGN in green and um, the galaxies in blue, there are these lower redshift estimates that we talked about before. I didn't uh, plot in the very most recent uh, uh, measurements here, this paper by Smith et al. a few years ago. You can see in general, the AGN have a little higher escape fractions, 20, 10, 20% than the galaxies, which are in the you know, five to 10% range, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. The error bars are huge. Again, it's not so much because the data has low signal to noise, that's sometimes also the case, but you need to in include this model of you know what you actually observe and what the probability is that foreground hydrogen in that direction could have diminished your signal. And that's what this Monte Carlo simulation shows. But in any case, we get numbers that are viable uh, of the order of you know five to 30% for the galaxies and the AGN respectively in this redshift range. So the giants clearly won, maybe not by a large amount, but they do dominate the reionization, but the galaxies were not uh, totally unimportant. So that's the first most um, important part of the talk. Then I'll show you some slides of what Webb Cannon has done. This is the last slide to lead into that. It was one of our first Whitefield Camera 2 images with the refurbished camera in uh, 1994 after the astronauts first went to um, refurbish Hubble. This is um, a cluster of galaxies, a proto-cluster, really a redshift 2.4. They all, all have Lyman Alpha in emission, and the central galaxy is shown over here. It's a radio galaxy, redshift 2.4, shown here in the various filters um, with the radio sources, contours here. Um, and the important thing is that the galaxy itself is fairly elliptical, you know, it's probably an elliptical information, but it has this blue cloud sticking out in the 10 o'clock direction, which is uh, caused by, um, you know, an outflow from the active nucleus. And um, also in Lyman continuum, this would be the direction from that active galaxy. It's a radio galaxy after all, it has a small quasar inside, which you can't see given the direction here, but it's shrouded by dust, but it would produce Lyman continuum in this direction. Um, this Lyman Alpha cloud has an opening angle of about 20 degrees, and that le leads you then to think, well, maybe if you look in that direction, you might also see the Lyman continuum. Of course, Lyman Alpha tells you that there is hydrogen in the foreground that's not ionized, so it may be hard to see the Lyman continuum unless you look exactly down the throat of the quasar, which in this case we're not doing. You'd have to be an observer over here to see it um, like that. So let's now turn to Webb. Web can, uh, as I said, provide constraints redshift bigger than four, where the IGM is opaque, but you have to do it differently. First, a reminder from last night, Hubble goes around the Earth every 96 minutes. It had over uh, 180,000 sunrises and sunsets in the last 33 years. The Webb telescope shown here over Saudi Arabia and the Horn of Africa, eight minutes after launch, had only one sunrise and one sunset since it launched. The sunrise, of course, is one of the launch fairing opened and the sunset uh, was when the big sun shield deployed. So we hope that the telescope will live 20 years or longer, but it was designed to be a 10 year stable platform uh, for deep imaging and spectroscopy. And it is much more stable than Hubble. Here's a giant beast, a very massive radio galaxy, 10 to the 11 solar mass is one of the most massive high redshift radio galaxies known redshift 4.11. First observed by Hubble, it looks like a cigar. I'll get to that, what that all means in three filters, you know, orangey, red, and near infrared, and then observed in six web filters. And it looks almost the same in all filters. This is total color picture. The supermassive black hole is in this southern component. Green is the radio map, 
and there is a jet flowing out in this direction. That's a relativistic radio jet. And then when you do a decomposition of all these images, in particular the 335 image, which contains the redshifted H alpha light at 65, 63 angstroms times, you know, one plus Z brings it over into this 3.35 micron filter. And the O2 line at 3727 would be dominating this filter. So we used medium band filters for this. They're all plotted here. And you can see the spectral model in green very precisely follows the data, including the Hubble data here. That's the Lyman alpha line. The oxygen line is here and the uh, H alpha line is in, in, in that filter. And so for every pixel here and every island of the modeling, we have a really good idea of what the spectrum is and it changes from position to position. So again, the black hole is here, uh, not seen of course, hidden by dust, but the relativistic jet is shining in this direction. And this is the region where most of the new stars are formed. This uh, yellow region is a shock and it's right at the, almost the same position as the radio jet. So we think that this uh, supermassive black hole, which is probably 10 to nine solar masses already, is producing this relativistic jet that triggers the formation of stars through the shocks um, in that galaxy. The star formation rate at this location only is 500 solar masses a year. That's 500 times larger than what we have in our own galaxy. So this beast produces an enormous number of stars and it did it only in 4 million years. The total star formation rate of this object is 1600. So the rest of the galaxy forms another three times as many stars. So, you know, if this was our own galaxy, it would have formed in a couple of hundred million years. Um, but it's not our own galaxy. Our own galaxy is a much smaller black hole. The um, Lyman Alpha cloud seen from the side in Hubble, and this is the Hubble filter that covers the redshift at Lyman Alpha, is quite wide. It has an opening angle of 50 degrees. The relativistic jet has an opening angle only of 10 degrees. We don't know quite in which direction the Lyman continuum will escape. I think if you look at the galaxy from this direction, you wouldn't see much because of the hydrogen. If you look in this direction, you may have a decent um, chance within 10 degrees or so that a good area is evacuated here uh, where you can see the UV radiation from these hot stars. This diagram, I won't go into much details, tells you how we tell the difference between uh, star formation, constant star formation in green uh, and, and shocks but you have various um, color ratios to do that. And we think that at least part of the galaxy owes its star formation due to shocks. And that then leads us to believe that it's jet induced star formation. There was a paper by uh, Duncan et al this last year based on one of our very first Hubble images. So here's a couple of spectra in the ultraviolet uh, measured in the infrared, of course, for very high redshift galaxies, 7.9, 8.7, 10 and 11. And again, in all cases, you can see the light goes here from nothing to something. Uh, very clear in all cases, the object, the cigar in the middle is the galaxy with the usual hydrogen and oxygen lines. There is no mistake about the redshift in these cases. So the redshifts are between 8 and 11 as advertised. And you can see the very dramatic drop from something to nothing at no longer the 912, but the 1216 angstrom hydrogen feature because any of the foreground hydrogen in the galaxy itself or the immediate foreground would have extinguished all this light. So you're not supposed to see anything here and there isn't anything here. So if we could see this radiation, we could say something about the alignment continuum produced by these galaxies. The SEER survey has also done a couple of others. There was one candidate redshift 16 that in the photometric redshift, you know, making combination of filters, trying to fit the spectrum, they thought, well, this object's a redshift 16, it's kind of red. But when you took a spectrum, it appeared to be a redshift 4.9 with high precision. And uh, there's actually a number of these galaxies at the same redshift there with very clear, I uh, have to get a little closer, oxygen and uh, hydrogen lines. And so there's absolutely no doubt about the redshift of these objects, nor is there doubt based on the same lines. It gets a little murky here, but the lines are still visible over there. Um, that this is, you know, these are the correct redshifts uh, for the one object that was published earlier by some group. They, uh, you know, missed the ball on that one. But we get very precise redshifts for these things now. And then um, 
or Redshift 10 to 13 candidates from the Jades survey, um, there are now spectra available between uh, 10.4 and 13.2 in Redshift. That's roughly 400 million years. That's roughly 300 million years after the Big Bang. And you can see the data is all quite solid. There is that very clear drop indicated. And then to the left of the drop, you're not supposed to see anything and you don't, you only get upper limits. So typically we call these Lyman break galaxies, typically how this works for Redshift 12, for instance, there is, a, it's always the dot in the center, in this case, a little smoothed. You can see the dot in the center is visible in all the reddest filters, but then suddenly below 200, uh, F200, which is two microns, 20,000 nanometers, it drops almost to zero. And then further to the left at the two bluest wavelengths, it's definitely zero. So it's very clearly what we call a Lyman break galaxy. And it's redshift is rock solid at 12.6. Um, uh, yeah, you can see the object here. That's the real data. So that's quite a convincing case. And that's why we have so many filters. So we can make this measurement very precisely. Now, if you model the spectral energy distribution, this red model based on the data there is here together with the spectrum, you get an implied scape fraction at that redshift of 20 to 70%. You can't measure it here because as I said, the foreground neutral hydrogen prevents you from seeing anything below 1216 angstrom, it just any light that you emit below that wavelength would immediately ionize or as excite the hydrogen atom. But you use the in indirect method to model the spectrum if you have an accurate spectrum. It's a paper by Robertson et al. Um, now, pub oops, now published, I think. A couple more like this. Um, yeah. Time wise, I'm going to wrap it up. So I'll skip this chart and basically give the same picture um, with you know a number of fairly convincing uh, spectra. The spectra are noisy, but you can see in all cases that there is clearly a cutoff at the red line. You can see it better in the images than in the, the line plot here, but there is a cutoff there, and that tells you then where the redshift is. Um, so I'm going to argue that these are not quite reionizers yet at redshift bigger than 10. These are redshift 10 to 13, but they will be by redshift 7, 8, where we see you know, reionization complete. And that's because of the following. Here's a spectrum by Bunker et al. Um, originally a candidate galaxy at redshift 11.1 um, that was really found to be 10.6, but it's close enough. Very convincing spectrum, 10 hour integration. Very clear Lyman break goes exactly to zero as it should. Lyman alpha line would be here. There's nitrogen, carbon, the whole shebang, magnesium, oxygen, more carbon. So the the uh, you know the the, um, the redshift is absolutely not in doubt. There's even nitrogen lines in there, but they say it's it's these are not predominantly AGN lines. They are actually lines that indicate star formation rate, a modest amount of 20 to 40 solar masses a year, fairly broad lines because the um, the outflow from the supernovae of this galaxy is, is uh, fairly substantial. So it's actually not an AGN dominated galaxy, but it is a galaxy all right and the redshift is quite solid. And so um, I'm going to argue that for these very early galaxies, massive stars, I don't remember if I showed this picture last night, but I think it's one of the best web images we have of a pre-supernova object, a 30 solar mass Wolf-Rayet star shortly before it turns supernova. But it already has been shed, shedding out its outer shells of um, gas and dust because it's in the uh, you know asymptotic giant brand stage where the helium uh, burning has proceeded to the outer shell. And so this is a prelude to the supernova stage and it has already expelled 10 solar mass of uh, dust, mostly gaseous dust. Um, what I find interesting about this object that it's to first order round, but it got two cavities here. You can see both at the mid, uh, near and mid infrared wavelengths. And I think it's simply because this star is rotating around an axis like this, and it's a little easier for the outer layers to be expelled in the equatorial direction, which will be in this direction and not in the polar direction. So when this thing goes supernova, you might actually have a nice set of 15 degree holes in this dust layer. So you could see um, the light from the, uh, um, uh, the, the supernova and 
whatever other stars there are in that neighborhood shine through these holes. Now, let me come to my last um, spectrum um, of web on some of these objects. This is one of the lowest mass galaxies. So it is in uh, behind cluster Abel 2744. I didn't show it uh, last night. It's a dwarf galaxy, uh, redshift almost 10, 9.79. It has a very low absolute magnitude, minus 17, compared to many of these others that they have confirmed spectroscopically now. So it's the lowest mass galaxy observed. There is there's its photometric spectrum, um, redshift um, 10 or 9.8 is the best fit. Here's the observed spectrograph spectrum with the overlaid uh, photometric points. So the spectrum is quite uh, solid at the stated redshift with the break here. You can also see there is a couple of lines. Um, there's no carbon or oxygen line, so it hasn't produced any carbon or oxygen yet, but there are some nitrogen lines. And that could be because that there is Wolf Rayet stars, these um, very uh, massive stars about to go supernova in that galaxy. And when they do that, my speculation is that um, the lifetime of the stellar population uh, which is typically 100 million years at that redshift. Later, there will have been enough supernovae to clear the holes in the interstellar medium. So here is for early stars with almost zero metallicity, what we think the HR diagram looks like, the paper we published a few years ago, um, predicting the observability of uh, population three stars. That's where the sun would be if it had no metals, it would be a little hotter, would live 6.4 billion years instead of uh, 10 or 11 as the current sun would. Um, the point is that, you know, the, the massive stars between uh, 1520 all the way up to several hundred solar masses produce supernovae and black holes as, as remnants, except for a small mass range in the middle where there is no remnants. Um, and then lower mass stars produce uh, neutron stars as uh, aftermath. And of course, low mass stars result in white dwarfs as they do locally. Um, but the supernova outflows come mostly from these kind of stars because those are the only stars that um, explode and they live less than 30 million years. So if a star burst, you know, the infalling gas forming stars lasts three times as long, which is typically what we see, average of 10, so we get three of these kinds of phases, then you could have up to 130, 140 million years you could uh, see the outflow. So that means then if you have these objects there already, redshift 10, around redshift eight, you may have enough holes in the interstellar medium to start ionizing the universe. And that's exactly what we see in the microwave background data. Um, two more, I think I have a, a few minutes left, two more slides on lensed objects I can't resist. This is another cluster with a now a submillimeter redshift measured by ALMA, so millimeter wavelengths, a very solid redshift 6.2. There is a um, carbon line there, very clear. The carbon line is not even Gaussian. It has a little bit of a wing. It turns out that this lensed object, which is sort of the outskirt of a lensed arc, like I showed yesterday, you can see them plentifully in the images in the lobby. Um, there is clearly a redshift 6.2 feature here. But there is also this wing at a somewhat larger frequency, which is uh, outflowing gas. It's shining in our direction, so it's slightly blue shifted over here. So we think this object already has an outflow, a carbon outflow at 230 kilometers a second. And there is not a lot of dust in this object. We don't see the 158 micron line, so it's still a relatively um, dust free environment, yet it's producing carbon probably from its own um, first generation of, of stars, including the wolf Rayet stars. And um, that then would also argue that there will be directions where this object at this redshift will have uh, vacated holes in its stellar uh, interstellar medium where you could see the Lyman continuum. Um, so here's the last image I have, the very highly magnified galaxy redshift 8.3 between max 8446. Again, it's a millimeter redshift. It's a very messy object. The stars are in blue here. The dust is not even in the same locations, already expelled in red, and the ionized gas is in, uh, in green. And you can see this object looks like a, a mess, a train wreck. So you can mentally imagine that there will be holes in that interstellar medium that if you look in the right direction, you could actually produce and observe the Lyman continuum radiation. You won't see that until the lower redshifts before the um, yeah, 
because of the foreground neutral hydrogen, but that process would already be um, in action at these redshifts. So I'll leave you this very last image of the Arendelle star, the single star in this highly stretched arc, redshift 6.2. We think that is no longer a single star, but actually a double star. We now have a spectrum of it. The spectrum looks like it's two humps. Um, a cool star, well, cool as in 9,000 degrees, uh, the red thing, and then a very hot star, 34,000 degrees, leading to the green overall spectrum. Papers by Welch et al. and Vanzella et al. Very high magnification behind this cluster. Also redshift 6.2, very low metallicity. It's not quite the first stars, but very early on. And, um, you know, producing enormous solar lum uh, solar luminosities, 10 to the 5 to 6 years. So it is these kinds of stars, including the you know, hotter component, a double star, that actually produce um, these um, UV photons. So I'll put my summary up here for the sake of time. Um, so both, both space and ground-based uh, alignment continuum spectroscopy um, play an important role in the reionization determination. White field camera 3 can do it well in this redshift range. Primarily the BIF-3 was designed for that. Uh, you need the deepest Hubble images to um, mask out all the foreground interlopers. You can't have any undue uh, light leaking in. And the AGN are three times brighter than the galaxies, but two times less numerous. So we still think the giants beat the dwarfs, but not by much. Um, well, I've said all this. I'm not going to say it again, except you know, think about this as the the guns or the castle with the, the holes in it, tiny holes or bigger holes, out of which the Lyman continuum radiation escapes. Uh, a larger fraction for the AGN, a smaller fraction for the galaxies. And JWST is now refining this at the higher redshift, where you can not see the Lyman continuum directly, but you have very good indirect arguments and precise measurements to make the case. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. The universe is reionized and therefore we can look through it. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, yeah. I would say that the outflows are far more important than we think. Um, galaxy formation and star formation is messy. You need to obviously have stuff flow in to form the stars or the central black hole. But that's not the end of the story. You get outflows from dying stars, supernovae, AGB stars, and you get outflows from um, um, the active galactic nuclei, which we see left and right. You know, you see that in the velocity structure and you see it in the images that um, in the direction of the relativistic jet, big shocks are happening. And then you need the outflows because otherwise you would not be able to see the line of continuum. We, yeah, we didn't think that the AGN were as important as they now seem to be and that the outflows be so powerful. Uh, you don't want to be at the wrong side of an AGN shining in your face. <laughs> Fortunately, we're in a quiet galaxy. <laughs> Good question. Uh, other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I'll go back to that. Uh, probably bunker spectrum, the highest signal to noise there is. This yeah. one? Yeah. And I think the argument. Yeah. Um, so the the models though, they're just uh, for the AGN. That's just a pure one hundred percent explanation of the. Yeah. So, so it, 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 you could imagine some blending. Actually, you know, the high amounts of star formation. You have a very interacting agent typically at the second order. Yeah. Right. Yes. So it, it, that that an interpretation that we're seeing in the AGN instead of. Yeah, so I skipped this part, but indeed the data says the line ratios that this is more star formation like these these uh, purple points are the models for various star forming trails. These are the models for various 
AGN trails, and clearly the data says it belongs here somewhere, so it's a star forming. But it, it's we've known for quite a while that if you see star forming galaxy, there's often an active nucleus in the center, like a Seifert galaxy has a small black hole that's still accreting. We see that nearby, and it, it is very well possible that all galaxies have, you know, all massive galaxies today anyway, and back then the less massive ones have an active AGN in the center, which you may or may not be able to see. In this case, it's not dominant, but it'd probably be there anyway. And the statement I made in the opening, that we see these very high redshift cloud galaxies, objects, are very dusty, and people now start to think that maybe those are shrouded AGN. So in, in the big question, you know, who came first, chicken or the egg? The galaxy or the AGN, definitely the AGN came first, I think. Formed, the black hole formed before the galaxy formed, it created a lot of material in that accretion process. It formed a galaxy, galaxy grew bigger, the AGN kept accumulating. But I think it started with the AGN. Sorry, I'm digressing a little yeah, bit, but yeah. It's an interesting thing, I mean. Yeah. Right, because I mean, it's active here. I mean, yeah. There's yeah. 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 It, it, it almost becomes semantics at some point, also depends on the viewing angle. If you look straight down the throat of a quasar, there's no question. Here you're looking in part through the dust and you see the star formation regions more than the AGN. I'm sure this thing has a hidden AGN. We haven't found it yet. The, the funny thing is if you look at these objects, lower redshift in the radio, you, you know, for AGN, you either see the radio jets coming out, I showed you an example, or you see a bright point source in the center, which, you know, tells you there's a quasar there uh, because such bright point sources in the radio don't come from star forming regions. But then if you look at ordinary galaxies at much fainter radio levels, you see the star forming disk in radio, which is the collective supernova remnants. But you almost always with VLBI resolution, you see a compact core in these galaxies, which tells you there gotta be some active nucleus there too. So it's both chicken and egg at the same time, but the egg still came before the chicken. Yeah, how's that? Yeah. All right. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, great questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you all.